This is Near Death TV. I'm your host, Laura Ketchledge. I'm also an author. In 1979, I became a near-death experiencer. I chose to explain the truth I learned about the afterlife, reincarnation, and near-death experience through my fictional book series, The Near Death Saga. While dead, I was shown all human beings are shrouded in ignorance by design in order to learn valuable lessons in each incarnation. When you die, the artificial facade falls away and we awaken from the dream into reality. For more information, you can find us at neardeathtv.com. Please join us as we explore the after effects of near-death experience. Good afternoon. Welcome to Near Death TV. I'm your host, Laura Kethledge, author and near-death experiencer. Today we have a very, very good guest. Her name is Candace Sanderson. She's also the author of The Reluctant Messenger. It's a great book. It's very insightful. And she's here today to share with us. Are you on, Candace? Yes, I'm on the line. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, fantastic. Well, there's so much to cover in this book. So, um, you know, what is your basic uh, message, do you feel, with a reluctant messenger? Well, uh, the reluctant messenger pretty much tells who I am because I was very reluctant about this journey. Um, I, all of a sudden, in August of 2013, started channeling messages from beyond. And it was, you know, as a psychologist, it was quite surprising for me. But after a while, I, I learned to really embrace these messages. And I, I, I guess the, um, the overall theme from the book is we are not alone. Uh, everything is energy. There's so much more to life than what our physical bodies are and what we measure. Um, I was able to communicate with so many different non-physical sources, and it was just wonderful to realize there's a whole team of non-physical helpers out there ready to help us. So the overarching theme of the book is really, really one of unity. And um, on those days where you feel like you're lonely and there's no one else in the world, guess what? You're not alone. There are helpers there to help us and guide us all along the way. Well, you know, what I like best uh, about your book is that you're, you know, this is a positive message. Uh, Candace, uh, I find you very uh, intelligent, articulate, and I think most of all, there's a lot of bravery to come out of the closet um, and tell, try to explain something that's almost the unexplainable. And another thing that I want to say is that, you know, you're an educated professional woman. You know, was this a big gamble in your life to write this book? Did you feel that at all? <laughs> yes, I, I kind of chuckled when you said, uh, when you mentioned me and you said bravery, because, you know, as a psychologist, um, I only believed in what you could measure with your senses. If you couldn't, you know, feel it, touch it, smell it, hear it, it didn't exist. And all of a sudden, I'm confronted with this message that just drops out of the blue while I'm driving to work one day. And immediately, my training as a psychologist came in, and I thought, okay, that's it. I've lost it. I've, I'm psychotic. I've, I've gone crazy. And, you know, it's like, no, no, I, I knew that wasn't true. Um, but I, I was so reluctant to accept it. But the messages kept coming and coming. And I, I just felt like I needed to really speak my truth, even though I, I realized there might be others in my profession who would roll their eyes at me and think, you know, she has gone off her rocker. But that, that was, is not what happened. Uh, I've been so blessed because so many people and a lot of professional people have, have embraced the book. So uh, 
it made me made me feel that I had really done the right thing by by not worrying about what other people might think about my experiences, just speaking my truth from the heart. I like that. I like that very much. On Near Death TV, uh, this show is focusing on the after effects, exploring the after effects of near death experience. What kind of parallel can you draw from your experience that is similar to a near death experience? Well, uh, I have one entire chapter in my book that talks about um, time, for example, and how time works. And the messengers in that chapter, I talk about how the messengers actually compared some of my experiences with near-death experiences. And it's, it's too detailed to get in over an interview. But let me just tell you that the messengers explained to me how it was possible and how an actual near-death experience uh, can occur. And m most people that have had a near-death experience will talk about this um, feeling of love, being at peace. Um, many of them say they don't want to return to earth because of all the trials and tribulations that we have here. But what I have found is once you start looking at the world through the filter of energy, you start seeing things differently. And what I've learned to do, and it's crazy to even hear myself say this, but what I've learned to do is to be able to step out of the block that I had, all the parameters of the physical existence, once I was able to step out of the physical senses, I realized I was in an energy field. And once you're in that energy field, you can start traveling and experience some of the very deep transformative feelings that people who have had near-death experiences have had. The only benefit is you don't have to have a near-death experience. But everything is energy. There's this continuum between where we are now in, in the you know third-dimensional reality, but the continuum goes all the way up to source, to enlightenment. And as we learn to use our energy bodies differently and we start expanding, <coughs> we can actually access those states that people had during NDEs, but we can access them intentionally. Um, you know, like I can never go back to what I was before, just what I thought I was before my physical body, because there is so much more to life than that. Um, we never die because we're energy. You know, we quote, and you know, air quotes, we are soul, we are spirit, we are pure energy. And using that pure energy, we can get into such expansive states that we can um, be so much more than what we think we are. Yeah, I, I, I get that. So was your catalyst uh, because of an out of body experience or astral projection, was that your uh, way towards you know, getting educated and experiencing non-physical reality? Well, my, um, well, growing up, I, I have always been interested in the non-physical. My mother had what we called a lot of ESP, but I, I was never psychic. I never had any kind of uh, talent in that area. And then one day while I'm driving to work, this message just drops into my lap and so on just one given day my life changed um august you know in in august of 2013 i just i just opened up and messages started fl just flowing in but there wasn't any particular event that occurred other than in retrospect um i had just attended a program at Monroe Institute uh -huh. in Virginia. And uh, Monroe Institute, 
uh, I, I've been to several programs there. You know, they they teach you to by using sound based technology, you enter different states of awareness. And I had been to a program where we were accessing souls of people who had just passed away, but they hadn't quite made it to the other side. This is a program called Lifeline. And um, I kind of hate to say this, but <laughs> I really wasn't inter that interested in the program, but it was a prerequisite for another program. So I went and, you know, didn't really have many expectations. And, you know, during the first exercise, nothing happened. And then I thought, okay, what's going on? And I reached outside my unit and grabbed my telephone and hit record. And all of a sudden, from, quote, nowhere, came a man's first name, last name, city and state, and another proper noun. Um, we were supposed to be getting newcomers, people who had just passed. Well, as soon as the um, uh, the event was over, we were all going to get back together and regroup. And I Googled his name, and Laura, I couldn't believe it. There was his obituary. He had died exactly three months ago to the day. I had his name, first name, last name, city and state, and then that other name that I had, I knew it wasn't a, you know, wasn't a, his name it was the place where he had worked so i actually had his place of um, employment that's fair and then, you know after that i i had five or six others with first middle last names in cities and states but what happened at that program is i had a transformation there was a tipping point where i no longer believed in this they became knowns instead of beliefs and I you know in retrospect that is what changed me so two weeks later I'm driving to work and all of a sudden I am just wide open to to receive messages and I've been receiving them ever since well I, I think that's fascinating and I'm really on the same page with you Candace because as you know and we've spoken before I'm a near-death experiencer so I had my accident in uh, 1979 and stayed in the closet. And I read uh, Robert Monroe's books uh, in the 1980s and 90s. And mm -hmm. it was more of such a common sense, logical explanation. So that was really kind of my compass, as William Buhlman's books have been my compass too. Um, and I kind of ignore everything else that's out there because uh, I uh, didn't really caught into the idea of, you know, the, the, the psychic world, you know, as, as right. you would say it, because nobody wants to be uh, thought of as a wackadoo. Did you have a fear that people would be mocking you out of like ignorance or even fear, fear of the unknown, fear that you had a little more information than perhaps they were comfortable with? Well, yes. <laughs> yes, I had that fear. And fear is not too strong of a word. I mean, it, it really was a fear. Um, for me to put my personal life out there as a professional, as a psychologist, these things that have happened to me, I knew that there were going to be people that didn't understand this. But what I've learned is truths discovered are always our own, uniquely our own. And my truth may not resonate with someone else, and that's okay. At some point in time, it might. Now, um, being interested in these kinds of phenomenons, what what uh, phenomena? What I would do sometimes at work during lunch is is I would mention something about energy or energy medicine or using, you know, uh, some kind of energy healing technique. And some of the and I was working at a school system. I, I retired a year and a half ago, but when I retired, I was a uh, working as a school psychologist, um, sometimes I would mention, you know, what I did, and I would see people literally roll their eyeballs. And it's like, oh, that's, that's okay. very disrespectful. That is very disrespectful. But, but, but no, it, what, what was great about it is I went ahead and spoke my truth anyway. 
you know, that's okay if that's if they want to feel that way. But some of those eye rollers would come to me afterwards. Sometimes it would be a day or two. Sometimes it would be months later. And because what I said to them resonated with them, and they wanted more information. So it showed me that when I was fearful of what others would think of me, you know, it really doesn't matter. Because if you're ready to hear the message, then you're ready to hear it. And these people that did roll their eyeballs came back to me and spoke. And and I, I couldn't have been happier. I couldn't have been happier. But we each are on our own path. Yes. And some want to step on the path we're on, and that's wonderful. And the others aren't there yet, and that's okay, too. You know, I think the, the listener, listeners will uh, resonate with this because, you know, of your integrity. And that brings a lot to your book, your personal integrity. Um, what was, you know, I'm kind of curious, Candace, what was one of the first important messages that you received? Not a general message, but sort of like a uh, dot the I's and cross the T's kind of message. Oh, well, I, I've got to tell you this, dot the I's and cross the T's. That's how the messages would come to me. They were so specific. It was like receiving dictation. Um, I got into this habit. I, I always would, an early riser, and I would always go to work at least an hour before anyone else. Um, I would, on my, I got to this pattern where on my commute to work each morning, I would get in the car, I would turn on my recorder, and the message would just start. And the messengers would say, new paragraph, when it was time to change paragraphs, they would spell a word. Um, you know, if it's a word I didn't, didn't, that I wasn't familiar with, they would tell me when to, what, what punctuation to use. It was pure and simple, just dictation. Um, it started off with the general message. Then a couple of days later, I got messages from people who had passed away, who had information they wanted to share with loved ones. Um, sometimes I had messages that talked about, it seemed like I was in school. They were giving me uh, information, like I, I mentioned earlier, how time works. Um, you know, how the brain works. You know, the brain doesn't think of anything. It's, it's actually just like a radio receiver. Um, I had some information from star systems, um, star systems I'd never heard of. And then I would look them up and it's like, good grief, there really is a star system named that. But the messages were, are, there's just so many of them. I, I actually visited a place that's, that they refer to as the realms of light where a lot of ascended masters were. Um, it's just been a tremendous journey and one that's been just absolutely so rewarding for me. I think it, it, it's fabulous that you're sharing this because I think so many people would be hesitant. But let me uh, ask you this. Ha, were the messages all auditory or did you ever any any visual like flashes, like pictures, like I have gotten? Um, were there any scenes flash in front of your eyes? Were you awake or were you out of body? And we're going to get into lucid dreaming and dreams later, but just in your waking hours, Candace, did you hear it all? You know, was it auditory or was there a visual uh, component to this? Um, quite often there was a visual con component. It started off when I would be driving to work, and so I would I would record. So that was auditory. I could hear what was being said. Mm -hmm. And then uh, later I started getting messages. In, if they were longer messages, I would get them at home. If I was sitting in front of the computer, I could just type them up. If I were at a meditation, for example, then I had more of the visions that would come in. And then it seemed that the more I received messages, the greater the visions became. Um, they sometimes were very intricate. I could explore different dimensions. 
And what was interesting to me was, and, and I've always been one to keep a, a notebook with me. So if something happened when I was in a in a group meeting or something, and I couldn't speak into my recorder to record them, I would, you know, jot down what happened, and I would I would write a couple notes on what I was seeing at the time. But even when I would go back months later and read what I had typed up, that same vision would re it would just like a like a rerun come right back into my mind and i actually wasn't even aware of how many visions i had been having until i went back and reviewed the older messages and it's like wow that's exactly what i saw at the same time so what happened is i think my my ability to visualize things got a little bit stronger and now when I go to a place to meditate, for example, I'll sit down in the room before other people get there and I start seeing patterns of energy that come and weave throughout the room. And it's it's just a way of, of setting up the message that's going to going to come later. So it's very visual now. It wasn't before, but it's um it, it pretty much is now. So do you have you ever seen things like as a picture flash in front of you non-moving just like a picture you know and you're you're looking like ahead like you know regular perceiving space around you in physical reality and then have a, a picture flash in front of you i think that's a form of telepathy but i was wondering if you've ever experienced that well let me let me give you an example in in one of my book in one of my uh chapters in the book called uh, stampede i think it's chapter number Seven. I don't usually get pictures. I get videos. Let me let me just briefly tell you. This is an example. I, I went to a place close to where I live in Fort. It's the place is in Fort Myers, Florida. It's called Church of Spiritual Light. They were having a meditation. I had never been before. I didn't know what to expect. They had crystal bowls in the center of the room, and all of us were lying on mats, you know, surrounding the crystal bowls. And as soon as the um, background music faded for them to start off with the crystal bowls, I heard this drum beat. Now, until, I mean, I still don't know whether the drum beat was actually in the background music or whether I just heard it, but it like took me on this different path. And all of a sudden, the very center of the room opened up for me and I saw this portal. And in the portal came a group of Native Americans. They called themselves the ancestors. I saw them, it's like a video playing in front of me. I, I just saw them come in. And then came a smaller group of Native Americans called the Council of Elders, followed by a tier of angels. Then this beautiful, tiny, white buffalo calf, newborn, wobbly-legged, White buffalo, uh, I, I could see the blue eyes. I could see like pink around the edges of his eyes and his ears, you know, as he came out. And then from the portal came this beautiful Native American woman. And she starts talking about healing. And this was a healing meditation that, that I attended because they were also doing Reiki, which is, you know, energy healing on people. And she said, we need to have the innocence of the white buffalo, like the white buffalo calf, the, the purity, the innocence of the white, the childlike innocence of the calf in order to open our heart so that we can be healed. And it was, it was very powerful. I had no idea what this meant, you know, other than just the message itself. And when the um, event was over, Reverend Bledsoe, the minister there, asked me if I had been ever been to the church before, and I said no. Now this is not like a, it's it's a church quote in a in a strip mall. It's only one large you know one large room. Um, she then went on to tell me that they had a healing bed in the back of the room, the back of the church, that was a portal. And she said, next to the healing bed is a picture of white buffalo calf woman. Now, she is a legend with the Lakota Sioux. 
But at this time, me being from Paducah, Kentucky, I knew nothing about her. She was not on my radar whatsoever. But I finally realized, oh, that was the woman who came in with the buffalo calf. And then Reverend Bledsoe said on the other side of this healing bed, is a painting that one of the Reiki masters had done. It was called, I think it's called Ode to the Masters. There's a picture of a portal surrounded by a tier of ancestors, a tier of the Council of Elders, and the third circular tier was nothing but angels. It was as if I had stepped into that portrait. So these are the kind of things that I get. I not only get I don't get pictures. I get videos. I end up reading the energy of the room and everything that that takes, sometimes everything that's taken place in that room. So that's kind of an example of what happens with me. It's it's very interesting, very entertaining. I go home and learn so much about uh, the world that I didn't know before looking through my own eyes that are guided by these non-physical beings, these beautiful guides. Well, Candace, I find your experiences beyond unique and very specialized. And you have incorporated them into your book, The Reluctant Messenger? Yes. That's fantastic. How is the book set up? What stages of your journey did you document throughout your book? Well, you know, it was interesting because I've had so many experiences and, uh, you know, I've always, you know, been really good about writing them down. So I had this manuscript that was hundreds of pages long. And then I had a group of messengers who referred to themselves as the muses within. And they told me I would be writing a book. And I thought, what? <laughs> you know, I don't want to write a book. They said, yes, you will be writing a book. They told me that it was already written in their realm, and they would help me bring it into the earth realm. And I thought, okay. I remember sitting down at my computer. I've never written a book. I don't know how to write a book. And I'm getting ready to, to pull in all this information. And I'm thinking, oh, I guess I have to start with the title. And I didn't have a title. And the messengers had said, if you're writing and you get stuck, that's because the energy's not flowing. You're not using your heart. You're using your head. Get up, take leave. So I thought, okay, I'll do that. I got up, started walking around a little bit, and all of a sudden my title came, The Reluctant Messenger, Tales from Beyond Belief. Um, because the tales that I tell are beyond most people's belief system. And they actually helped me pull together the material into different chapters because so many of the chapters are, are so different from the others because my experiences have been from communicating with people who have passed over to learning about time to visiting um, ascended masters, and actually witnessing creation. But not all of my experiences are in the book, but certainly enough of them to make a, to make a book full. Candace, you know, I'm seeing the second book. I'm, I'm not saying this in a, the psychic uh, intuition. I am just seeing such a, a vast amount of experience and knowledge and expertise and the way that you tell the story that I think you're going to captivate readers because I want to read it. Um, I purposely <laughs> did this uh, interview before reading your book because I think it would give me a different target question, you know, what I was going to yes. get out of your book. Now, you know, I really want, want to get on the dream connection. I believe that there are lucid dreamings out of the body, you know, you're having a dream out of the body slash experience or a uh let's see a lap you know that there is almost a fold over while you're uh dreaming so absolutely give me your theory on lucid dreaming um what is the importance of dreaming i know this is a lot of questions at once and what is your book how do you go about explaining the importance of our 
lucid or conscious dreams? Okay. Whew. Well, first things first, you mentioned a new book, and I actually am working on a new book. It will be out later this year. Wonderful. Uh, the, the title of it is The Reluctant Messenger Returns, An Unexpected Adventure into the Angelic Realm. So the second book talks a lot about the connections that I've had with angels, and not just angels, but other beings in the angelic realm. Now, dreams. I absolutely, Laura, love dreams. I have kept a dream journal for many years. It is over 250,000 words long. Um, there's uh, even a chapter in this book called I Dreamed a Dream, and it's all about dreams. My mother, for example, I mentioned earlier, she used to be very, she had a lot of ESP. She would have these dreams, and I can remember one day I was home from college, and she woke up and she, she told me this dream. She said, I dreamed about Jana. Now, Jana's my sister, older sister. She said, I'm, I'm changing the name, uh, and I didn't use the name in the book. I, she said, Mama, Mr. Gregory is with me. And my mother told me that, and I thought, that's kind of strange. Then that afternoon when the evening paper came, we saw Mr. Johnson's obituary. Oh he had God. died suddenly. Now, my sister had passed away like two or three weeks before from a car accident. Oh, I'm so sorry. And, and so here is, well, thank you. But here is my sister coming to my mother and saying, Mr. Johnson's with me, and there's his obituary. And I could not wrap my mind around this. I mean, I knew it wasn't just a dream. Like, how is this possible? How could this happen? Now, years later, I've learned that that is what's called a visit or a visitation. Yes. Where those people from the other side will come in to us. And why... Are dreams the most common entry into the non from the non physical? Because we don't judge it. We our egos aren't involved when we dream. When we dream, we'll walk through walls or fly, and we don't say, "Wait a minute, we can't do that. We can't fly. We can't walk through walls." No, our judgments and egos are set aside, so it allows whatever happens to happen. And because we don't stop and question the event, it just keeps running its course without us interfering. Now, dreams are a stepping stone or can be for those who really want to expand their awareness. And one way to do that is ex exactly what you were talking about with lucid dreaming. Learn to wake up during your dream. Now, Many years ago, I live in Florida now, but when I lived in Kentucky and I was working as a clinical psychologist, I would work with a lot of children that had nightmares or night terrors, and they were just, they were petrified. And I would, without really knowing what I was doing then, as far as the, um, you know, the energy goes and working with dreams, I would tell them, stop in the middle of your dream. And back then, I didn't even know what a lucid dream was, but I, I taught them, you've got the power. So if that monster is coming towards you, you just stop and you look at him and you turn him into, um, you know, a puppy dog. Turn him into something else. And these children, some, some of them were as, you know, young as five years old. They could do that. Um, for us as adults, it takes longer. It, it's not as easy for us to achieve that. But um, that's just a wonderful way to start stepping into the world of, the, of the, the spiritual world is through those dreams. And keep a dream journal. The messengers have told me to go back and review a dream that I've had sometimes 15 years before. And I have my dream journal online. I, I get in and I search it and find out what the dream was. And then they'll give me a different interpretation of the dream. And I don't always, once I write my dreams down, I don't always 
well, not that I don't always. I hardly ever tried to interpret them. I just document them. And later, the meaning comes to me, and it you know becomes significant. Um, you can have so many precognitive dreams. I remember having a dream that a lady I worked with was expecting, and I saw her the next day at work, and I said, uh, when's the baby due? And she just sat down on the couch, my couch in my office, and her mouth dropped open, and she said, how did you know? We haven't even told anyone yet. It's like, well, I knew because I had a dream about it. But dreams are so important um, because that can be the key to unlocking awareness. I think that's uh, very, very well said. You know, what are one of the things that, you know, that uh, uh, an interviewer wouldn't even think to ask that you find that is unique in your book that you want to share? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Just one thing, one random thing. What what I what probably strikes me is the information that I have received from uh, cosmic beings. Uh, some of them are associated with asteroids. Some of them are associated with star systems. But they have told me over and over again that they are protecting us that they are actually changing the frequencies of their sister star, their, which is our sun, in order to help us. That they are actually watching us on Earth and giving us help. And, you know, there's so much negativity in this world. And, you know, I, I do a lot of reading and I read the, a book the other day that just looks so beautiful. But part of it, part of the message was it had a little bit of doom and gloom. And I thought, no, 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 that is not the message I'm getting. The message I'm getting from, from just a variety of messengers is we are okay. And, and we will take care of our earth. Things will work out for the better. Just keep your path learn to use your heart to open up and to using that heart energy and things will be fine. This is not going to be, um, you know, the end of the world doom and gloom that so many people think it is. So that's probably what really, that's the first thing that comes to mind to me is knowing that we are not alone, that there are a lot of entities out there willing to help us and they're helping us in ways that we can't even imagine. Well, I think that is a very, very positive note. Now, uh, what I learned, you know, uh, through my near-death experience, I've, I've had nothing, you know, I'm not on the same journey you are on, but perception is really such a tricky thing, Candace, because yes. I would, you know, I would think that this being that I ran into well, uh, you know, at first, I'm not super religious. This isn't, wasn't a come to Jesus moment for me. Um, it was a spiritual awakening. But I have the feeling there were different, perhaps, versions of myself helping me. Not angels, but uh, other souls, yes. But also other souls that were me at different times. If that is, you can wrap your mind around that one. That is some of the perception uh, that I got. But I believe that everybody on physical reality, all human beings, we all have a cheerleading squad on the other side that's trying yeah. to help us along. And possibly, do you think that could be different versions of yourself, like you helping you? You know, absolutely. And if you'd asked me this question several years ago, I would have been an eye roller, you know. But I've learned so much from the messengers that, there is a path to enlightenment, and as I mentioned earlier, it's a continuum. And the messengers have told me that the only difference between me, where I am right now, and um, some of the ascended masters, some of the saints, some of the angels, the only difference is where they are on that path to source, where they are, because the further you go on that path, more enlightened you become and as you become more enlightened you are able to accept more energy into your being 
And, you know, angels, my next book is going to be on angels. But the angels have told me, don't think of us as winged creatures. You know, okay. if, if well, they don't say don't think of us. They said it's okay to think of us as, as winged creatures, that, you know, we will accept that. But there's so much more than that. But they also realize we are so limited because of our physical bodies. We can't really, we can't accept a lot of energy frequencies into our system without actually causing some physical damage. This is why we need to step outside of the five physical senses and start using our heart in order to expand our energy bodies so that we can accept these greater frequencies that are coming in. And the more we can accept those frequencies, that's kind of our path to enlightenment. So these non-physical entities that are guiding us, maybe that's our higher self, which means that's us. In fact, the angels in, in my next book, they told me all about a higher self and the higher self is that connection because they the angels won't interfere in our daily lives unless we ask them to but every time they come to me in a meditation their energy is so strong i just break down and sob and it's like if they were with me all the time there's no way i could i could function i couldn't even drive a car much less you know do any kind of uh, worthwhile work but they use the connection of the higher self um, in order to bring in those energy frequencies that we need but they're titrated at a level that's acceptable to us so are we part of the continuum and as we go on that we're gathering more aspects of ourselves absolutely that makes perfect sense until we all become one and if there's unity we're we're all one anyway. Yeah. So that that it's makes sense. Thing, but it, it, you know, it sound a, sounds a little bit out there, but actually, I think there's a lot of uh, truth to that. You know, my experience has have been you know fragmented and random, and I am no psychic, but um, because of my near death experience, because of going to source, even for those few minutes. It was my game changer and one of the reasons that you know led me into taking my paranormal experiences and putting them in fiction because i didn't have your courage i wouldn't say this happened to laura kethledge till much later in life so you know i'm 60 <laughs> you know i can wave the freak flag at my age it's okay but you know, have a little humor with it a little uh humility uh and to be humble i think do i think that's kind of the key because It can be really overwhelming. Well, you know, it can. But, you know, I just was at the point where I I guess I really just didn't care. And, And I knew that there were people out there that needed to hear something from me. And, you know, some of them, some of them did. And, like, for example, the book, um, I cannot tell you how many how many people contact me each week on how the how my book has really affected them and helped them. It's so interesting because each person seems to take another, you know, a, a different piece out of the book that was important for them. And just the fact that this has helped people to the point where they actually search me out on, you know, Twitter or Facebook or you know, LinkedIn um, to find me, it's it's just remarkable. Um, I, I've actually, I have um, a YouTube channel, which is very uncomfortable for me. I have like over 50 videos. Well, please tell us I know. how people can get in touch with you. What is your, oh. uh, tell us your YouTube info. Well, it, you know, just go on um just just google candace sanderson and and you'll find me or or you can go on my website which is candace with an i c a n d i c e candace sanderson dot com and you'll find my my blog and my blog will have a link to the videos or or just google candace sanderson and you'll see all these videos but 
this is part of my role as a reluctant messenger. You know, they kept telling me, no, you got to be this messenger. And I am so uncomfortable in speaking. It's one thing writing a book, okay? But yeah. then in speaking about it in front of people, I mean, I used to do training for the school district I worked for, and I could sit up, in, you know, sit in front of, you know, 400 people, stand and, you know, give them, um, speak all day long on, you know, topics related to, you know, my job as a psychologist. But, and I can speak to small groups about what's going on with me spiritually, but to open up um, to a large number of people, that was pretty intimidating. So I just forced myself to make these videos. And uh, every time I do one, I cringe, but it's like, okay, I've got to do it. So I do, because the word is out there for someone to hear. Exactly, exactly. Well, I think it also, uh, you explain and write very articulate because you have that inside edge as a psychologist. I think that has been such a, a, a bonus to all this because we all have human fears. We all have, you know, we're all scared of the unknown to a degree, but letting go of the fear and opening up is uh, easier said than done. It took me a long journey. I guess I'm a slow, uh, slow learner, but uh, <laughs> have you experienced uh, any healing, any physical healing to, for your health? Oh my goodness. Uh, yes. We, uh, my next book starts off with, with the miracle. I had um, a bilateral thyroidectomy and when they took my thyroid out, this was back in, in November of uh, 2012, they paralyzed my vocal cord and I could no longer speak. I, I could only whisper. I had to wear a microphone and carry a voice box that I would hang on a lanyard or, or if I had pants on, I could hang it on my belt um, for people to hear me. And here I am as a psychologist working in the school system. I have to have my voice. voice. You know, I mean, I have to. It's my lifeline. Yeah. And three months later, in February of 2013, I went to, um, I did a weekend program at Monroe Institute in outside Charlottesville in Virginia. I was part of their local chapter network, and we were actually doing a, a program um, for the volunteers who were, we had volunteer chapters all over the world, and I was one of the speakers, and I had to explain to people why I was wearing this voice box. Mm -hmm. We were also live streaming, so I had to have a microphone for the, you know, online, and as I explained, I told everyone in the audience, because I know there's a lot of healers there, that, you know, I'm, you're welcome to send me healing energy, and to make a long story short, I had just been two days before to um, an ENT who had scoped my throat and said, you have a paralyzed vocal cord, which, of course, I knew I did, and he was going to do surgery. I was supposed to come in the following week to do the pre-op um, appointment, and I said, I'll, I'll call you. I'm going to be out of town. I'll, I'll call you next week and schedule it, and by the time I got home, my voice had returned. No surgery, nothing was needed, and it was all an event that happened at Monroe having to do with just divine intervention, angels, healing. You'll have to read my next book to find out. Exactly. <laughs> but, uh, I wanted you to, to share that uh, positive uh, experience, you know, miracle. I'm uh, going to Monroe this uh, spring for the first time, which I'm really thrilled about. Um, oh, wonderful. Now, can, where can we buy, when, where can we get your book? Where, where are you selling it? Uh, the easiest place to get it is on Amazon. There are a couple books, or actually three books called The Reluctant Messenger, but mine is The Reluctant Messenger, Tales from Beyond Belief. And it's also the only book with my name on it, Candace Sanderson. Uh, it's also online, like barnesandnoble.com, but uh, Amazon is a real uh, quick, easy place. To get it. It is an ebook, paperback, hard book, but it's also on Audible. Oh, and wow. I have been 
I had been so surprised um, how many people have listened to the book on Audible. It's about a little, I don't know, 10 or so hours long. But I, if you're not an Audible listener, it is it is so cool because you can slow down the um, the narration or you can speed it up. But, uh, uh, you know, so it is available on Audible as well, too. Oh, I think that is really wonderful. And I like your message. Now, uh, can you... Do you uh, mention your website and blog again? Yes, um, the website is www.candicesanderson.com. And on the website, you, you'll see there's a tab that says um, blog. And anytime I, I do a video on YouTube, there's also the written blog. And the written blog is much more polished because when I speak, I, you know, I'm just, you know, I mean, if I have a message, I'll, I'll read that. But other than that, I'm just speaking like I am here. But if you want to hear something nice and polished, then just follow it, follow it on my blog, on my website. Well, you but know, you can I'm also catch me on on Facebook, Candace M. Sanderson, um, you know, LinkedIn and um, Twitter as well, too. Well, that's wonderful. I'm a big believer of an unedited interview because I think you get a natural flow to the conversation. And this has been a terrific conversation with Candace Sanderson, who is the author of The Reluctant Messenger. This is a must read or must listen to book. I wanna thank you so much for being on Near Death TV uh, today. And I've had a wonderful time. So I'm going to end this show now. And I look forward to my listeners joining me on the next show. Great. And thank you so much, Laura. I had fun. Thank you.